record. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Contemporary Issues class here on August 16. I think we are today, a smoky Sunday in Colorado with all these fires going on. And in addition to everything else going on in the world, we have hazy days from five fires in Colorado. So uh, always something, and this is our newest thing to deal with. So we're going to talk today about life in the COVID era. It's been six months now, and it'll be another six months or longer, for sure. And so we're going to just catch up. This was a good suggestion by Gene Dawson to see how we feel about going out and mask and lots of topics. So we're going to talk about that today. We've got 23 so far and more coming in. So... Welcome. We are recording this for replay later, as we usually do. Um, so before we start today, how about any announcements? Anything going on anybody would like to announce? Mm -hmm. I've got a couple things. Well, first I should, said, should say usually, as we do, mute yourself on the lower left corner of your screen so we don't hear background noise too much and then when you talk which a lot of us will do today unmute yourself and talk loud so we can hear you um, I've got a couple announcements um, coming up this Thursday is the St. Andrew Church Council meeting which is our uh, highest governing committee and they have not been online for people to watch for several months, and they are going to this Thursday. They're gonna start doing that. So um, it was on the e-news, the Zoom link, if you wanna get on and watch our church council discuss our um, COVID situation and finances and staffing and things like that, I encourage you to listen so that we're good members and we know what's going on. So that is this Thursday, and I'll email out the Zoom link uh, to you too on that. Uh, next week, we're gonna talk about Donald Trump. We talked about Biden last week, and we got through it just fine, so I'm hoping that next uh, Sunday we can just do a biography and the pros and cons around uh, Mr. Trump, and I will lead that and hopefully come out alive from that and we will have a good time. And then two weeks from now, uh, Rev Mark is gonna join us live. He emailed me this morning and uh, answered my request to come on with us. And he said, I would love to see all of you again live. And so he's gonna do that on August 30th. So he will be with us then and bring your questions. And we'll just have a live discussion with Mark about anything church related, theology related, and that'll be fun. Any other announcements? Um, Connie Dix is having a shoulder replacement surgery on Wednesday, so prayers for okay. her, please. Good. Glad to hear Connie's doing okay. There, Vicki's gonna make notes. <laughs> Anybody else? When I hear shoulder replacement surgery, I know people have had artificial hips, artificial uh, knees. Do they put in an artificial universal joint shoulder now? I guess, I don't know <laughs> the specifics of it, but. The shoulder replacement is one of the most um, invasive and hardest to recover from. I've had several friends that, <coughs> I had to drive them a lot because, <laughs> uh, you know, they can't drive and there's a lot of therapy. So uh, uh, Connie will need a lot of uh, prayer for this one. It'll take 10 miles off her fastball too. <laughs> That's good, Tom. Okay, thank you, Mary. We'll keep in touch with her. We'll check on her, okay. All righty, um, let's talk about COVID life. Life in this era. I thought uh, our senior pastor, Rev. Mark, uh, sent a good summary of life today in just a few sentences on his message this week. He said, the world is a mess right now. One U.S. American is dying every minute from COVID-19. 
educators are facing enormous challenges and fears as they head back into the classroom. 30 million Americans are unemployed. Millions more are facing evictions, food insecurities, child care challenges like we've never seen before, profound emotional stress. Meanwhile, the country is at war with itself over the merits of wearing masks and the civil liberties of social gatherings. So I thought we would talk about that in the context of that background. Let's talk about things like uh, what we are doing with uh, going out to stores and restaurants and what we are doing with family and the other categories of life today. So first topic I did was uh, going, set for us was going out. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just read a little bit of things I found on the web for a minute or so uh, to spur our conversation. And you guys jump in with your thoughts on each of these topics, okay? Um, one of the pieces of advice I found on the web said that uh, a doctor saying, uh, that this is not the time to do impulsive shopping and spend a lot of time in the stores, in her opinion, this doctor. She said, make a list, go into a store like a Marine, parachute in, get what you want, and parachute out again. I thought that was a good analogy. She said, visit stores in off-peak hours when there are fewer customers. Of course, keep your distance. When you go to a pharmacy, for example, go early in the morning before the crowds are there. There are special hours for older shoppers, especially at grocery stores and pharmacies. Uh, of course, wear face mask, keep your distance, bring wipes with you to wipe down uh, carts, and no great need to wear gloves that the primary method of transmission is respiratory. And even though there is a small risk of contracting things from surfaces, that is not the usual way that this is contacted. So those are the main recommendations from a CDC doctor that I found on the internet. So I wanted to see what you all are thinking and doing about going out. Are you going out as usual, just with precautions, or are you staying home and reducing the number of trips you make to places? Jump in and tell us about that. Jim, there, let me unmute. Go ahead, Jim Watson, I see you talk. About going out. Um, uh, I have worked on the census in two previous census years, and I signed up uh, to do it this year, uh, thinking mistakenly that uh, it was going to be conducted by telephone and computer. But I, when I went to their orientation, I found out it was uh, and going to involve uh, personal calls too. So, in view of that, I had to resign because I think it's too much uh, exposure for a per person in my age category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to speak louder. Mm -hmm. Good point. How about uh, eating out at restaurants? Vicki and I've eaten out a few times and usually try and do it on the patio outside. Are you all doing that too or are you eating inside of We places? haven't been doing it, and I, I would like to have people who have been doing it uh, tell us what their experience is, so whether they think it's uh, safe for us to do that or not. Apparently, they, you know, if they found it wasn't, they wouldn't do it after the first time, but I'd like to know what people's experience are. That, uh, that okay. Susie, go ahead. Um, Sharon and I ate out last night, and um, we went to a brewery over here at, in Highlands Ranch, and a lot of people were eating in outside, and there was like us, and, an, and it's a huge place, us and a, a table of eight about two miles away, and then a few <laughs> other people. There was like no people eating hardly inside. You hardly saw anybody, but there were outside people. 
and the places we've gone to have been, they've done, I think the restaurants have done a good job if you're going to eat inside. Uh, Steve, Mary and I have a, an alternative here. We eat outside. What we do is we take the food and we go to the nearest park or state park. So we've become very much park people. Uh, so that's kind of a compromise that we've worked out. Mm -hmm. Parks, very good. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go up to Summit County and in the Breckenridge area. And uh, we ate out uh, in the main street of Breckenridge one evening in a fenced in area of a restaurant. Uh, many of you might know uh, Eric's, that's a sports bar up there. Nobody was inside at all. There were about eight tables fenced in outside and we had our meal out there. Uh, <clears throat> up by Silverthorne, there was a really nice restaurant along the Blue River. I felt very safe there. So those two, and I've been back 14 days and I haven't had any um, incidents of uh, any danger from that. So, but other than that, we ate at our condo. So, but it was uh, nice to see that I don't think I saw a person without a mask up there. Uh, everybody had, well, maybe the dogs didn't, but the little <laughs> kids, <laughs> the little kids and the, uh, all the people had masks. Uh, and those were the only two that we felt safe enough to try. That, uh, that was the first I had tried eating out. So, uh, this is I'd like to add to what Judy is saying because I was up there at about the same time, and I believe it is a city regulation that you be masked both inside as well as outside. So, Breck, everyone was wearing a mask no matter where they were, and um, I was feeling pretty comfortable and you you can't do that while you're eating but <laughs> absolutely while not. you are not you, <laughs> you must have to take it off to eat yeah. Yeah, exactly <clears throat> hi this is sharon i just recommend going early before the crowds and then you have more tables inside that are available you know for distancing so uh i found that it's not so bad going out early like early five o'clock but Friday, Saturday, um, six o'clock? No way. <laughs> uh, this is Jane Watson. Uh, I wonder about the people who are serving the food, if you eat in a restaurant. Um, are they being tested regularly? What is their precaution? There's not been much media coverage of that question, too. Are the are the young people cooking the food, coughing on the food, and are they tested regularly? I haven't seen much reporting on that. Yes, that would be my major concern, and we haven't gone to any restaurants. Uh, uh, the, the server where we ate up there, uh, it was a long table. There were four of us, and they could have uh, served maybe six or eight, and she stood at the very far end and put the food down there. And then we took it to where we were. Uh, she was definitely socially distanced from us. Well, this is Sharon and I think, yeah, this is Sharon and I think that probably the servers are all good about wearing their masks. Uh, I don't know about the kitchen staff though, and that's one other thought, but um, <coughs> at some point, if you're gonna get it to go and not eat in the restaurant, you're gonna have the same cooking staff. So you can't really go by that. You just have to assume that they're following all the regulations. My son-in-law manages a black eyed pea. Can you guys hear me? Yes, Lois. Oh, okay. And uh, he has for a few years, so it's not new to that, but he tells how strict they are with their workers and everybody that deals in and, and with them Dealing with the public, they're very, very strict. Good. So I like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Steve, I, I have three daughters and all of them work in the service industry. My oldest daughter and her boyfriend actually own two pretty big establishments in Deep Ellum in downtown Dallas. And um, I, think, I think the guidelines vary from state to state and from county to county. Um, in Texas, the guidelines are really, really strict. And I know that the Dallas County Health Department is really very strict on restaurants reopening right now. 
Um, Peter, who is the owner of the restaurants, has told me that um, not only are the health guidelines strict, but the TABC is also all over them about, you know, people coming in and um, how they're serving things. His, his restaurants are unique in the sense that they have a bar, a restaurant, and a big music venue attached to them. And so there are certain things they can do and certain things they can't. But um, I, I think as far as testing the staff, um, I think that's really up to the owners. I, I know that Peter um, is very careful with his staff, both in the kitchen and the servers and the bartenders. Um, but, it, I, you know, in Texas, I can tell you, it just varies from place to place as to what the restaurants can do with their staff. Some, some people are really great about it. Some people, not so much. You know, you just don't know. Thank you, Jerry. Glad you could join us today. Great. Okay. This is Terry. Terry, I've, eat, go ahead. I've eaten at Chili's on County Line. I've eaten at the Mexican Brewery 3. They have an outside patio. I've, <coughs> I've eaten at Cheddar's on East Arapaho Road. And I've been going to Benedict's for breakfast about once a week. And so far, everything seems to be well run at those places. I was wondering if anybody is ordering anything like Home Chef delivered to your home. Um, uh, you know, where I, they I, have the meals <laughs> delivered and then you uh, make them, your, prepare them yourself. And uh, I started it in January uh, before this all happened. And I found out it was a really good thing to do because I get uh, uh, three meals that serves two. And since I'm by myself, I get six meals a week. And uh, so two, three evenings a week, I cook some really good vegetables and some good meat and uh, then have another plate the next night. And uh, I don't buy a lot of um, those kind of things at the grocery store. I just have this delivered. And it's fairly reasonably priced. There are several different uh, types of those. Maybe some of you have tried some before, but it's uh, to me, it's really worked. Yeah, Judy, that, that's a great suggestion. My wife and I have been using HelloFresh for mm -hmm. about two or three years now. We got it in Texas, and then we have them delivered here. Yeah. And we have three meals delivered every week and um, they feed four because there's three of us in our household yeah. and yeah, they're, they're great. And I, we have found that actually we save money because yeah. if we were to go to the grocery store and buy all that stuff individually, like a la carte, um, it would be more expensive. Plus it saves us trip to the grocery store, right? We only go to the grocery store to get, mm -hmm. you know, just odds and ends. And then we have three meals a week where we can cook them um our, our, ourselves and it's it's very good i know there's blue apron there's hello fresh there's the one that you mentioned um yeah, we found hello fresh to be the easiest the blue apron they're kind of hard <laughs> so if you don't like to cook they're, they're kind of complicated to make but the hello fresh you can tell them um like how complicated you want things to be you know if you're medium easy or difficult yeah. whatever so and they and they tell you how long it takes to prepare it and they have a recommended three meals mm -hmm. each week but you can substitute something else in i mean you can uh choose and um uh, a lot of chicken so i've been trying other things too so good suggestions okay Let's move on to talking about masks for just a couple minutes. It's a, a part of life now. We've got different types of masks. So I did a quick look on the internet as to what are most effective types of masks and what are the least effective. And the Duke University Medical School says five most effective masks are the fitted N95 mask with no exhalation valve. So it's just a tight fit over your face. Then uh, also three layer surgical mask, cotton mask are good. Uh, two layer polypropylene mask and the two layer cotton pleated style mask are good. The three least effective types of mask are the gator type uh, neck fleece. It comes up from your neck to cover the face. And also the bandana mask, that just is a bandana open at the bottom of your neck 
and knitted mask, K-N-I-T-T, -T, knitted mask, are not effective either. Uh, the doctor from Duke says a good way to tell if a mask is good at blocking particles is to hold it up to the sky. If you can see daylight through the mask, it's obviously not good. It's not going to stop particles. Or you can take it and blow on it really hard, and if your air goes right through it, you can see that it's not blocking much. If a standard three-layer surgical mask is available to you, get these. And also a double layer cotton mask is also fine for most community mm. settings. Mm. Just be sure not to wear an N95 mask with a valve because the mask releases air and defeats the purpose of wearing a mask in the first place. This doctor says, if everyone wore a mask, we could stop 99% of these droplets before they reach anyone. In the absence of a vaccine, it's the one proven way to protect yourself as well as you can. <clears throat> so how have you been thinking about masks? Have you been using the standard blue cotton mask or have some of you gone for a fancier multi-layered mask? Uh, uh, we have, uh... Just one, uh... One uh, correction there, if I can. Wearing a mask, unless you're wearing a, a surgical mask or an N95, doesn't protect you at all. It protects you from sending it out to everyone else. So don't feel like you are protected when wearing a mask, wearing the usual mask that we have. That's an important thing to understand. Wearing a mask is a little gift to everyone else. It's not for your benefit. That's not what I've read, Tom, in my research that some of the masks are varying degrees effective in stopping particles yeah. from coming into your right. nose. N95 and surgical masks, but not the majority of the cotton masks of, you know, two layer cotton masks and, and those kinds of things really don't protect you from the particles coming in. That's not what the Duke University Medical School says, Tom. They say two layer cotton masks are effective. For particles coming in or particles going out? It doesn't specify which yeah, way. That's, that's the key thing. It needs to specify that. that that's, <clears throat> that's what I've read. It's, it's, uh, okay. it, it's a little gift. The way I think of it anyway, it's a little gift to everyone else, not a gift to me. That's good, too. Good to know. Linda, did you start to say something? Um, early on, I made the pleated masks and used those cloth masks, but recently I've just switched to the Costco box of blue paper ones because they seem to be just as effective and there's 50 in a box so you can, you know, yeah. get a couple boxes and have them on hand and you don't have to worry about washing. Good point. <clears throat> Good point. How many, how many people have, like me have seen this, the typical comical thing that's happening when you watch somebody get out of their car, get halfway to the door, and then go, oh, Forgot turn around, mask. go back, grab their mask. It's pretty hilarious. I mean, I've done it myself too, but to be watching people, it's just, I mean, some of them get right up to the door with their hand on the door handle, you know, and it's like, ah, you know, and you could just read it. It's all over their face. Yeah. Or people just wearing masks over their mouth and not their nose. Yeah. <laughs> Or just around their neck. And that doesn't do any good. Something I've seen is I've seen um, masks on the ground. You know, it's a yes. Hello, <laughs> throw it in trash can. Don't. I'm done. And throws it down. You know. But it seems to me that if you have a mask over your mouth and your nose, air that you breathe out is is held there and you breathe back in your own air. How is that helpful? Your own air goes out. That's a good question. I was gonna show you that uh, Jim and I have been using these masks that I ordered them, these filters. And so we put these inside of the cloth mask that I made, which are three, three layers. And then we just put these on the inside and you can change these, throw them away. And anyway, we, we, might we just tape them into the, we just tape them into the front of the mask uh, 
inside the mask. In, inside the mask, and it provides an extra uh, uh, layer of, of protection. But, um, and they're, they're just made out of paper, I think. Well, actually, no. It's got a bunch of layers. Okay. And they're a mask, of course, that have filters that slide into the yeah. mask. Yeah. Polypropylene filter, which is a better type, they say, and <clears throat> those are becoming I, more available. My question to everybody is this What do you do when you're at King Super or Safeway or something like that, and you see somebody in the produce department not wearing a mask and picking up the produce and handling it and sniffing it? Do you go over there and and uh, box their ears? Do you kick them in the shin? <laughs> or, or do you yell at them from across the produce department and say, hey, he's not wearing a mask? <laughs> or, no, but you wash your, when you get your fruit home, you wash it with soap and water. Well, you soap. Why you do that or squirt it with, that, with, with something that's poison? We do that. <laughs> Jim, you could throw a potato at them. Yeah. That's a great idea. I, potatoes. I, I'm trying to be yeah. respectful and not talk over people, so I'm always raising my hand. That's that's what this is all about. But I was interested to know, not only in the grocery store, but are people exercising outside and are they using their mask while they're outside? I have not been choosing to do that because I can stay socially distanced, but I also ride a bike and I keep thinking, sometimes I'll see people with you know bandanas, but it is super hard for me to wear a mask while I'm biking. And we know that you can get something from a slipstream, so I'd be interested to know how people exercise. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a good point. If I could pick up on that, excuse me for uh, Anne, uh, just a second here. This dilemma here, and I think there's a, it's a kind of a cohort effect. I know that uh, in the community wherein we reside, people are very good about wearing masks. But I have a tennis group, and they're all younger guys, and they refuse to wear masks, and it's very awkward. You either say I'm not going to participate, or as I do, I just stand aloof. They get the signal that I'm just going to keep a good amount of distance between me and them. But how the rest of you are handling it with friends, particularly some of your younger family members or friends, uh, it's a badge of courage not to wear a mask. How are you, how are you mediating that tension? Or is, uh, is that a non-issue for most of us? Gene, that's a perfect segue into our next category that I've got, what to do about family and friend gatherings. So let's get into that. Are your family and friends helping or are they hurting the cause, so to speak, as Gene brought up? Well, to further define the problem, with schools opening, uh, our grandchildren, uh, their uh, contact uh, ratio has now just, uh, just mushroomed so that they're in contact with um, probably uh, uh, 10 times as many people as they were before they went back to school. And I don't know, uh, I'm feeling very, very confused about whether we can have them come see them or anything, have them come see us. Mm -hmm. Well, in our family, uh, we have not had much contact, but when we do, we are well distanced and we are not together very long very short period of time, no touching, everyone is masked and uh, uh, have mm -hmm. a few words to say because you're not there very long together. Our son and, our, and his family and our daughter and my sister who, is, who had suffered a stroke <clears throat> are very restrictive themselves and for us. So we have had no contact, just maybe Zoom, or that very short contact outside, <coughs> kind of <coughs> a condo parking lot and on the grass, and sit. Yeah, there are there are uh, more ca uh, cautious and, and concerned than we are. <laughs> yeah, they're more uptight about it than we are. That's good. That's good yes, to hear. we appreciate their concern for us because of our ages, and. Uh, and themselves as well. Very good. Susie, I think you were talking, but you're muted. You're right. Okay. 
Uh, my daughter and grandson came on the plane from New York two weeks ago. And the minute they walked in the house, she made him take off his clothes and her too. And they both took a shower. So they, you know, from the airport and all that and being mm. in on the airlines. I thought I never would have thought of that, but that was a really good idea. Mm. Everything went in the wash and they took a shower. And you burned and then we said home. hi. Mm. Yeah, the employees at uh, Home Depot, they they provide, Home Depot provides a mask, but they require that when you get home, you strip down in the garage, put your clothes in the washing machine, go up, take a shower, and then you're okay. You can put on your other clothes and join the crowd. It, in other words, it's all over your clothes as well as you're in breathing in. So, wow. <laughs> then I think about, you know, going to the grocery store, even though I have a mask on and they do too, we all have clothes on. So where is the line? I mean, what's happening there? Good question. Nora Lee, go ahead. Thank you. I was also interested, and I know this is not exactly on topic, but I was thrilled to be able to get an actual book from the library. And mm -hmm. You know, I went in with my mask and checked it out, but then I, you know, threw it on my washing machine for a couple of days because I figured that can also transmit the virus. So I don't know if people are concerned about that as well from, you know, inanimate objects that you bring in. And I know mm. people are uh, washing their groceries and stuff, but I'd be interested mm. to know if anybody's been to the library. Well, you can wipe off. If you get a book from the library, and I do this sometimes, I know that people around have been touching that book. You wipe it off with some of these, these, what do you have, these rags or something that come out of a can. Just keep them handy and take, pull one of those out and wipe it off. Now, I'm uh, concerned about the pages inside the book, too. So well, <laughs> that's that true. Yeah. Uh, here, uh, Jerry, you may want to add something to this. When they deliver the food like they do, uh, I, we're supposed to put the box like in the garage for uh, 24 hours. It, is, it has ice in it and everything, and uh, mm -hmm. wipe down the outside of the box like you do when you wipe down cereal boxes when you get at the grocery store or whatever you do. Uh, do does your delivery have the same kind of suggestion for your food? Um, it, you know, if they do, I don't know. I mean, I, I will admit that um, we're not that hyper vigilant in our house. <laughs> um, you know, like we don't, um, you know, the box comes in, it's on the thing and I usually just pick it up and immediately just open it and unpack it because I know yeah. it's got, yeah. you know, food in it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, my, my wife is the one that kind of manages that subscription for us. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if they do have something like that. Yeah. Um, well, how long does the virus live or last on an inanimate, uh, like a box of cereal? Does it, last, does it live very long on that box of cereal on the outside of it? Um, I really do know the answer to that because um, I've had a piece of paper that I got from somebody in the mail from mm -hmm. one of the hospitals and I've kept it all this time. On paper, it doesn't last that long. On clothing, it doesn't last that long. Just a matter of hours. But they say never shake out your clothing. Don't shake clothing because the virus then can fall off of your clothing and float in the air. That's the wow. only thing. But it, it, paper and cloth, apparently, it doesn't last too long. Thank you. Well, we've got all kinds of experience here to share. That's right. Okay, let's move on and talk about churches, the impact on churches and ourselves as frequent church goers. Um, I had a friend in my covenant group, men's covenant group last week that said, the longer this goes on, the more I like just getting up on Sunday morning and tuning in online, and I don't want to drive to the church and get on my nice clothes, and maybe I'll just continue doing that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's not a good thing, because we want to return to church in person. Mm -hmm. So does anybody else feel that way? And how do you like the online service format? I'd like for us to discuss that. 
but I'd like to say something about that. This is Terry Twilliger. Go ahead, Terry. There's two issues. One, we're in Douglas County. And Douglas County is the only county that I know of at the moment that allows libraries to be open. Because down here in Centennial, they're not. The other thing that concerns me at the moment is that our church has a preschool that is opening and following the Douglas County school system. Mm -hmm. So we have part of our building, even though it's it contained area, that's operating on one set of regulations, and then we're in another, and, but we're also in Douglas County that really doesn't have any rules and regulations. Uh, yeah, this is Tom Reiner's here. If I may, I have been really enjoying the way that the, the church has been doing its uh, online uh, presentations. They've gotten very good at it, and I've really been enjoying that. But I tell you what, I really miss the actual interaction with the people too. Uh, once too. we get back to church, I would look forward to experiencing some of that too, uh, because I, I really enjoy the uh, interaction with all the people and the church is the best place for doing a lot of that. So I'm looking forward to real church again. Me too. Norley, go ahead. I am. Uh, in agreement with Tom, but I also have one little piece of feedback. I don't know about you guys, but I love the chat feature, and I appreciate the fact that we've got that opportunity to see each other virtually. But um, what really gets to me is when you get asked questions in the middle of the sermon. It's like, I'm paying attention to the sermon. Don't ask me any <laughs> questions. I, I'd be interested to know if anybody else feels that way. And my two cents. Thank you. Yeah, you're well, trying to read the chat and listen to the sermon at the same yeah. time. Right. You know, that's a good point you're making, Gene, again. Uh, uh, conversely, it's almost paradoxical in a sense. Zoom brings us closer to one another than we would be in church if it were live action, even though I agree with the rest of you. Mary and I certainly miss the human contact. There's no, no doubt about it. But on the other hand, Zoom does give a glimpse into the informality and the personal contact you sometimes don't get in our uh, larger church gatherings. Do any of you feel that uh, there are perhaps some advantages to the Zoom experience? And that may be just rationalization, certainly, but as far as a more personal glimpse, you get into people's bedrooms, offices, kitchens, etc., cetera, and so forth, whether we like it or not. <laughs> this is Terry. I'd like to comment on the parking lot outing that we had where we met the new staff uh that was very good we had we should have those more often everybody was spread out and the staff and people got to walk around and everybody kept their social distancing and i think you know, we ought to do more of that and then we would get to get back to having more fellowship yeah, what do you think about outdoor worship service with limited number of people, 300 or 500, and you sign up online? I know that option's been talked about. And Jerry, if you want to weigh in on this also, please do. Yeah, so, I mean, th there's a couple of things that I'm thinking about. Um, in, in regards to the preschool, the comment that was made earlier, you know, I want to let all of you know um, that there are very, very, very stringent guidelines on the preschool. And those guidelines have been discussed and talked about, and they are being very, very careful, um, even to the point where we don't allow the staff from the preschool to come up to the main workroom upstairs. Um, and in addition to that, some of the staff like uh, Rhonda, and Cindy and some of the other folks in the youth and children's area have actually moved their offices upstairs to distance themselves from the preschool. Um, so they, you know, I don't want you to worry about that. I don't think it's a double standard. Um, I think what they're doing is they're going to open the preschool because it's such a necessary community service and they're going to monitor that very closely and they already have a lot of protocols in place for if somebody does come down with COVID. 
Um, so there's, there's that part of it. Um, I, I'll also tell you that, you know, we have discussed as a staff um, having more outside events. Um, according to Douglas County guidelines, from what I understand, um, we have to limit the number to 250. Um, so, you know, three, four, or 500 is out of the question. Um, two, two, 250 is the limit. Um, I think the hardest part with the worship service or anything that might draw a bigger number than that is you have to think about the logistical ways you would keep track of that. Um, you know, would we have to register people? Would people have to make reservations to come to worship? Um, you know, how, how would we manage that? So I think those are the questions that they're knocking around. But, um, you know, I, I, I want to assure all of you that, yeah, we're really thinking hard about this and thinking about ways to live into our vision of eradicating social isolation. And, you know, and one of the ways we do that is to foster community. Um, so, you know, be, be assured that we're thinking about that and very hopeful that in the future, very soon, that we'll be able to plan more outside events utilizing the parking lots. Yes, uh, Jerry, uh, Gene, uh, Gene Dawson again, you know, in Southern California, drive-ins are uh, <laughs> a way of life. And, the, and some of us remember the drive-in movies of the 50s and, and uh, <laughs> even more recently, uh, Red Rocks, uh, Easter services and so forth. It would be interesting to have an experiment sometime. I don't know the, the logistics of parking lot big enough to have people come together in their automobiles like uh, drive-in movies. Uh, uh, how they function and so forth. I don't know if that's part of the discussion. And uh, again, I know the logistics would be a bit complicated, but at least worth a try. Okay. When we had that uh, meet the new uh, staff and we had communion, we got in our cars and listened to it on the radio. Uh, I thought that was a good way to do it. Very good. Any other thoughts on the impact on churches or how we should be doing our programs in the service? Um, could I have one? I'll raise one point. Um, sure, they do a great job technically putting on the service, but in a way, it makes it really cold. I would almost prefer they do it Sunday morning from top to bottom. And if they're flubs, they're flubs, they can recover. I realize doing some of the video stuff that, that Kellen does would probably go away, but I just get the feeling it's, it's cold. It's, it's, it's yeah. a production, it's not a service, so. I just wondered if anybody else has similar feelings. I feel the same way, Dave. Uh, I agree with that too, it's cold. <laughs> I notice also that the service is ending consistently in 45 minutes, that seems like that there's a big rush to get get everything through and the, and the seams, the, the transitions between different uh, parts of the service are so quick that I feel like I'm not really uh, moving out of prayer time into whatever comes after that, uh, that, I, that is such a quick transition that I, uh, all, I'm about five minutes behind schedule. Well, is it recorded at different times? Sorry, I can't really hear you. Some of it is recorded in advance, we understand. Yeah. And it's, and it's uh, spliced in. So I don't know whether the whole thing is recorded or whether any portion of it is is done live. But I think it's all recorded in advance and then and then spliced together uh, uh, all the s different segments. I, I believe that it is recorded in advance to keep the number of people that are in the sanctuary at the same time down to a lower number. Yeah, I've participated not. in the music that's been recorded, and it does feel much better as someone who's making that musical offering to be physically distanced and safe. And it's done during the middle of the day sometimes. I don't know about others, but I'd be interested in knowing what are the factors that perhaps are financial or health reasons or whatever for us doing that kind of uh, splice together um, service. 
All good questions. We'll take those forward uh, to the staff and I'll try and find out some of those. Um, I appreciate our honest questions here. I think that's part of what we do. Okay, and I know it's uh, common for other churches currently are doing it the same way too. They are doing uh, recording on different days and making it more efficient and safe for the staff to make a service that way. So, One more been... comment, Steve. Go and, ahead, Jim. And that is that um, uh, a long time ago, uh, we spent a lot more time in the services uh, talking about uh, uh, concerns and joys of individuals in the congregation. Um, and it seemed like that has been minimized in the last three or four years and to the point now that uh, when we have the, uh, the worship online, uh, the names are just listed down at the bottom without really very much um, acknowledgement about uh, what's going on. And uh, it says prayers are needed for, for uh, somebody, but it does not say anything about what is happening, whether they are, have lost a loved one or whether they are in the hospital or anything like that. And there's no, and there's no opportunity for joys either because there could be uh, great opportunities here for people that have good news. And Lord knows we're all looking for some good news these days. Um, it would be neat to have some opportunities to uh, call somebody up and say congratulations on, on uh, graduating from, from such and such or something like that. It would be neat to, to have those opportunities to, uh, to share, each, share each other's joys and each other's woes. Uh, and since we're ending so, so early, uh, it seems to me that we have plenty of opportunity to explore in this area to bring the congregation, make it much more personal uh, and to bring faces back into into the worship service, so we can see some people that we've been missing for now here, here. seven months. Here, 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 here. Steve, I also wonder if anybody is really concerned about having their personal information out on the internet via the you know virtual meeting, virtual service, forever and ever. I mean, do you really want to expose the fact that in your joys and concerns, you've you know put that out on the internet? Well, That's probably an issue the staff has to consider too. Yeah, how much personal information to reveal. So I'll pass that on. All good suggestions. You were going to say something? Um, Jerry, I don't know if it's a possibility, but I wonder if there could be some type of a, and I don't know the definition of Vespers, but if, um, or something like that where we could have maybe an hour long um, service that could be done just like our church services are, but only for that purpose, like a prayer time service where joys and concerns could be shared um, and people would tune in for that purpose. Oh, yeah. I mean, I understand that I was limited to the Sunday morning service, but um, I agree with um, uh, Jim. Yeah. Jim that um, it, it doesn't, we don't have that element involved, but even maybe just a little praise and worship and then um, a type of prayer and concern time, you know, if that isn't a possibility. Make it more like our regular service was. Is that this what you Harry. mean? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, that, that's a very historical thing. Um, you know, even within the boundaries of Methodism, which is pretty much Anglicanism, um, there are daily offices that you can do um, from the Common Book of Prayer from the Episcopal Church. And um, some of those include Vesper type prayer services. So I, you know, I'll take that back. That's something that I've mentioned in um, our pastoral team meetings every week is that going forward, you know, I would like to take the lead in, in doing something like that. Um, Vespers and uh, prayer services usually last about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, they're scripted. There's a liturgy that you follow. Um, but, you know, I, the only thing I'll say about joys and concerns is, is believe me, I completely, I, I, it's a joy for me to hear your concern for your community and to want to share that with one another. But to Norley's point, um, you know, there are considerations about what we can say and what we can't, because remember the people who tune in online are not just members of our community. They could be anybody from anywhere. 
Um, what I would encourage you all to do <coughs> during this time, and I can talk to Kendall about this, is, you know, we know what's going on. Kendall is doing a wonderful and amazing job of keeping track of pastoral care concerns. And at any point in time, if, you know, you felt like you wanted to be connected to that, I'm sure that you could reach out to her and, and say that. Um, now, the, the thing that you said about the joy in our community, I think is interesting because we brought this up last week in our pastoral care meeting. And I don't know if you noticed the prayer today, the pastoral prayer, that there was a lot of joys in there. Um, you know, and it was written by Lauren, and, and Lauren was very intentional about saying that we need to stop just thinking about the worries and the stress and the concerns, that we need to voice our joy, that we need to give a voice to the happiness in our life and to give thanks and praise for that. And so I thought she did a beautiful job um, uh, today uh, with writing that prayer and offering that. So I, I you know, we'll, we'll hope to do more of that. Um, but yeah, no, I think Vespers are a great idea. I mean, I'm very old fashioned. I'm very orthodox. So <laughs> I, I would love to put on my vestments and sit there in front of an altar and do Vespers for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely thinking about how we can do that more, more often. I can remember when we used to go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And Sunday morning was more um, learning and education and preaching. And Sunday night was more praise and worship when those kinds of things happen, you know. And um, uh, I, I, I would just like that, you know. I mean, people could sing along at home if they wanted to and, and uh, you know, enjoy the joys of people and the concerns of people. And um, <clears throat> the fellowship, I think, would be great. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is Terry. I like how many of you on the Go St. Andrew has downloaded the Sunday bulletin before you watch the service? In the Sunday bu bulletin, there is some of that information, there has been, which all of you could look <coughs> at ahead of time and it would answer some of the questions that you just brought up today. Mm. Good point, Terry. Good point. Okay, good discussion. Thank you so much. And we can share some of these thoughts with Mark when he's with us in two weeks. And actually, I'm going to invite Jerry, Rev. Jerry, uh, to be our guest sometime soon also, if he would like to do that. We'll talk about uh, Christian discipleship and other things about the church, too. So throw that out there, Jerry. You'll be getting an invite to be our guest. Uh, Okay, we've got about eight minutes or six minutes left now. Let's wrap up with uh, thoughts on how COVID is reshaping society. Uh, not just churches, but also uh, offices. You know, there may be fewer office buildings full because people will be remote learning um, and other ways. What are you thinking about? on what the long-term effect of this is going to be. Movie theaters may not come back as strong as they were. Types of jobs, it may be a major reshaping of our economy. Shopping is a big change. Mm -hmm. More uh, online shopping. Mail order purchasing is just skyrocketed. Yes. And Amazon is moving back into some of the shopping malls that have been vacated, opening retail and distribution centers there. One problem that I'm having is that it's so long between uh, fill-ups of my gas tank that I kind of forget how to do it, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just glad that I don't go in office buildings right now because I think they're going to be come like the horse and buggies because everybody's online. <laughs> and as a former accountant who appreciates the pushing the paper, <laughs> and that still has to be done. But I, you know, these big chains, these big retail chains are all declaring bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And what has been their workforce? It's been the lower end people or the women getting back into the workforce after raising their kids or it's, you know, what's going to happen to that whole segment of society? What will they be doing? 
on another note on the personal on the personal uh, note on the more personal side i think it's also strengthening uh, family ties and also relationships with your significant others if you're fortunate enough to be married or have a spouse or partner i think there's been a deepening of those relationships on the positive side i realize there are also some tensions that can go along with that but on the other hand i do sense in hearing from other people that it's also had a strengthening effect we realize how precious how precious these relationships are thank you and we're going to rely a great deal more on technology to connect us all together uh, in uh, in different and in, in various ways like this for example we'll learn uh, uh, zooming kinds of protocols how we talk to each other and how we uh, uh, hang out with each other and things like that. And speaking of technology issues, I would like to ask Terry Twillinger, if you would please, you have by far and away the best and most clear video of anyone. What is the technology you're using to get the, to get the, the video that you're getting? Well, I got a webcam from Amazon. Now we don't see Terry or hear him, but he has had the best video and audio for a while. <laughs> we'll come back to you, Terry. That's okay. Uh, can um, you hear me now? Yeah. Go ahead, I, Terry. I, I got my um, webcam camera from Amazon, and it wasn't very expensive, like 35 bucks, and it plugs into my computer in which, of course, I'm doing Zoom through my computer, but uh, that's a, it's a very good camera and it's high definition and it wasn't expensive, but you can get it at Amazon. And it's a separate plug-in, it's not in your computer. It's not plugged in by USB USB port. port, very good. So you don't, ha now right now I have my microphone plugged in separately to the, uh, to the camera because if I use my web camera, uh, a microphone, I have to get too close to it. And I like <coughs> to sit back so I have a, an ear earpiece and a microphone that I you do separate from my camera. But the camera can do both, but you gotta have the camera near you so everybody can hear you. Okay, good to know. Let's do, let's let Nora Lee speak and then Judy, and then we're gonna wrap up pretty soon. Thank you. I was concerned about folks who don't have access to technology. You know, being, you know, in a socioeconomic class that's privileged, we have this technology available. And what about those people who don't? Yeah. Right. Judy Hall, go ahead. I hesitate to bring this up, but I've been ordering things online. And for some reason, it takes a lot longer these days. And yeah. yes, it's not delivering things as quickly. <laughs> Uh, things from uh, Amazon or from Apple. I ordered something from American Girl. Uh, sometimes they're two to three weeks out. And uh, so when I order a birthday gift set somewhere or send a card, I sent a card to Nebraska and it took 10 days to get to Lincoln. Yeah, I, I know. Oh, I asked so about that, That's a major change, I think. <laughs> I asked about that, and, and the post office said, well, there's a slow up in our service right now because we're so deluged <laughs> that we can't keep up with it all. And if we vote, if we the voting part goes on in the mail, we're going to have even more trouble. <laughs> but that's been a, a, a change I have, I have to adjust to. It's mm -hmm. going to take longer for delivery. There's yeah. an excellent article in the Denver Post this morning about how the... Uh, uh, elections are conducted by mail in uh, Colorado and I've, I've been an election judge uh, two different years uh, and uh, I can report that from what my observations were for both Republicans and Democrats that they are very strictly honest and above board in, in uh, doing their work on the election. Mm -hmm. And as far as family, Jim, go ahead. Family relations are concerned. I don't know any if many of you saw the uh, the cartoon in the paper 
uh, or in the magazine, I can't remember where I saw it, but uh, the young mother is sitting on the couch with her, with her daughter and they're having a very serious conversation and the daughter says, mommy, am I adopted? And the mommy says, no, honey, I just put the ad in the paper yesterday. So. <laughs> Good one. Okay, we need to wrap up. I see Connie Dix is on and Connie, we're thinking of you in your shoulder surgery and praying for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Everything goes good for you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you Come everybody you. for joining us. Good discussion today. Lots of good practical tips. And thank you everybody for being with us. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.